Welcome to MOOC course on Introduction to Proteogenomics. In last lecture, Dr. Prateek Jagtap talked to you about the workflow of RNA sequencing to faster database creation. In today's lecture, he is going to continue the discussion about bioinformatics solutions for big data analysis. He will talk more about the output files and data analysis to understand the unraveling the questions in hand. He will also be talking about three workflows, RNA sequencing to variant FASTA database, database searching using MS, MS data and identification and visualization of novel variants. He will explain about search query, a set of freely available algorithms for mapping the MS, MS data to peptide sequences. He will also talk about Loricate viewer a spectra viewer of all the B and Y ions identified in the mass spectrum. I hope it will also refresh you about previous lecture by Dr. Karl Clauser where he gave you the understanding of manual interpretation of data sets. So, let us welcome Dr. Pratik Jagtap for his today's lecture. So, uh, these two tools both of these workflows this one as well as this one generates a protein sequence FASTA file as well as a mapping file, right. Um, so, this is a protein sequence FASTA file as you can see there is the, uh, the ensemble uh, uh, identifier here along with the name of the protein uh, if it is you know if it is uh, if that if the function is known and this is uh, another one and the genome mapping file basically gives you uh, again the identifier of the or the accession number of the protein, which chromosome it comes from, what is the start side, what is the end side and it also gives you the, um, the length of the exon. Now, one of the things you will observe here is this is uh, basically saying that this is a 174 base pair sequence uh, or basis sequence and then you, you can see that there is uh, uh, some gap between this and this. Uh, which basically shows that there is an intron present there, right. So, this kind of helps you to map your uh, regions of, um, uh, of, of, the, um, of the protein. And later it actually also helps you because uh, if you just identified a peptide from this protein, one can use these coordinates to go back and find out uh, what are the coordinates of the peptide as well. <coughs> okay, so, um, let us say let, let us imagine that we have run that workflow right this workflow we started with the fastq files and the fastq file as well as the uh, gtf file ran through these all of this and you got a protein sequence file and so this is how your history looks like once you go through the documentation once you use the, go and access the galaxy instance go through the documentation after the first workflow you have this as a history and one of these here would be a protein FASTA file that you can use here for, uh, for your analysis. So, the second part here is you have your RNA seq database or protein FASTA generated from your RNA seq database. You have your MGF files which you have acquired from the same data and now you search it with uh, uh, we have got a tool called search GUI um, which basically has at least 9 different uh, search algorithms in it. Uh, so, it helps you to identify um, uh, peptide spectral matches and then um, it uses peptide shaker to uh, perform both FDR analysis as well as protein grouping. And then uh, there is another tool called as MDZ2 SQLite that is used uh, to perform uh, further analysis. And it also generates peptides so that you can perform blast P analysis. And blast P analysis is important because you want to go back to the NCBINR database and ensure that this does not these peptides do not match to uh, what you have. And there have been some instances wherein something that we found to be a novel peptide just a month before is no longer novel because somebody annotated it, right. So, you have to ensure and even report in your manuscript that December of 2018 this still was a novel peptide. Now, in January maybe it is not, but at least you have covered your uh, requirements by saying this is the database I searched against uh, on this date, right. So, um, I might actually skip this slide, but this is a really I mean I, I, I use this slide a lot to uh, explain the complexity or the process of how st you start with how we start with proteins, uh, digest the peptides, put it through LCMS, uh, LCMSMS and identify them. But 
you know this basically captures uh, everything and you know you have perhaps seen this many many times so I won't go through this. But this is a really good article this comes from one of the uh, from uh, Jorgen Cox lab um, uh, in Germany and it covers most of the contemporary uh, proteomics research that is going on. So, something I would suggest to go and read if, if you are really interested in basics or even uh, contemporary um, uh, status of, uh, of proteomics. So, um, again you take your spectra you match against your protein database and you, you know you can identify your peptides. Um, search GUI as I said is a freely available software uh, you can also run it uh, as a GUI, but we have got in galaxy. So, it kind of runs in the workflow that I mentioned and then there is peptide shaker which basically does protein inference does FDR analysis and identifies not only peptides PSMs, but also proteins from your sample. It also generates a MZ identimal file uh, which you can use it for further processing. So, in this second workflow right. So, we are in the second workflow now you have we have got your our protein FASTA from RNA seq data we have our MGF files and we want to search that. So, what it does is it takes those two inputs uh, does searches the data uses peptide shaker to generate multiple outputs and then this goes into a tool what we call as MZ to SQLite tool. So, what it does is it takes any tabular outputs and generates a SQLite database out of it. What it helps you to do is it, it helps you to perform some more complex analysis on your tabular inputs and get outputs from that. So, instead of uh, you processing this tabular file files in multiple processes you can have it in one place and then perform uh, uh, more complex queries on that uh, to get answers right. Um, and eventually what comes out of this is you identify peptides that we think are novel in the sense they do are not pre present in your reference proteome and then you can take those peptides and subject it to blast p analysis. So, that kind of covers these two uh, workflows the first one which generates a protein fast file the second which gives you two outputs one is your peptides that are sub going to be subjected to blast p analysis and it also gives you a, a mz2 sqlite file and I will talk about it what it means right. So, the third workflow which I think is the most interesting because you kind of you know this these two workflows you can in some way maybe the second one you can use it uh, you know you can use any other software to do it right. You have a MGF file you have your RNA seq generated protein FASTA file you can use any search algorithm to get your outputs. But these two workflows are something that you can uh, you know with our uh, the work that we have done hopefully helps you to uh, get it done easier um, um, on your data sets. So, the third workflow uh, so by the end of this your history would look like this it will have 54 items and these are there are 54 of these because you have kind of added uh, you know outputs from each of these tools. Again uh, and this is just as a backup in case your search has not run because uh, you know because it got stalled or because of some reason you can always go back to that uh, uh, to that galaxy instance I talked about and download the history for uh, for the third workflow. So, again the same uh, you know uh, process you take your active history run it with the third workflow and what does the third workflow have? The third workflow basically uh, takes in inputs from workflow 2 which is this blast p peptides for blast p it also takes the PSM report. So, the peptide spectral match report from peptide shaker and this is generally at 1 percent global FTR uh, and then it uh, also has this mz2 sqlite file. So, this is basically all the information in your mz identimal file right. The mz identimal file is the file that is generated by a protein uh, or PSM search uh, that particular file all that mz identimal file information gets into that. And this is really important because it also has information about continuous b ions continuous y ions all the spectral annotation information and that is something that you can use to process your data. Right. So, MGF file basically is just your peak list right it is it, it does not have any any peptide annotations right. While the MZ identimal file has that and has got lot more information. I 
I mean if you want to use the you know the next tool which is the ability to look at the spectra right uh, view your spectra then you should have a MZ editable output in general and uh, there are many software which do that. I mean scaffold does that uh, protein pilot does that uh, I am sure uh, proteome discover does that though I have not used that. So, there are you know MZ editable is a quite a standard output nowadays uh, that most of the software generate. So, um, but that does not I mean so that will if, if your software does not do that then it will avoid you to um, do the spectral visualization, but that does not mean you cannot do the rest of the things in this workflow. But again if you run it in galaxy since search go and peptide checker do that you can use that right and then we also had this genomic mapping file from workflow 1 right. So, all of these are actually used uh, in the last workflow and what it does is uh, you know so this this tool here which is the query tabular tool. So, remember I talked about taking tabular files and generating a, a SQLite database out of it. The SQLite database now can be queried and you can only say show me those peptides or peptide spectral matches which are novel right. So, you are matching it against the known database and try to find that and these novel peptides um, or sorry these novel peptides would be a result of this NCBI blast that you have done right and these novel peptides uh, or novel PSMs now can be converted to just peptides and these peptides can be subjected to uh, uh, looking you know generating an output which can give you peptide its genomic coordinates and other information. So, I will basically talk a little bit about that. Uh, so, there are two tools used here one is peptide genome coordinate and peptide pointer. So, um, looking into the details right we had this blast P peptide from workflow 2, this also from workflow 2, workflow 2 and this one from workflow 1 and then uh, uh, you know you by NCBI blast P you use certain rules and these are the rules that we used is if the peptide uh, it is if it is blast P ident is less than 100 or uh, there is at least one gap present or if the blast length is lesser than uh, your your query length then you basically uh, call it uh, a novel peptide. So, and we have kind of used this on multiple data sets and these three features seem to be enough to identify a novel peptide. So, that is the uh, that is the information used here to identify novel peptides and then uh, and then it uses this tool called as pep pointer uh, to generate a tabular output that you can use for further analysis. But before that I will like to uh, maybe talk about this thing called as MZ2 SQLite which is used as a an input to visualize your data. And I would really strong if you are really interested in spectral visualization I will strongly encourage you to go through that uh, the, you know the galaxy instance and the documentation because this really does not take time uh, each workflow takes I think the first one takes 12 minutes the other takes just 2 minutes each, uh, but you know it will help you to go through that. So, what the MZ2 SQLite data does is it takes this MZ identifiable file that you have and generates a list of all the peptides that have been identified with associated information. Now, you can select novel peptides. So, remember we actually identified some novel peptides here which are already in the history you can use that. So, you could say I just show me the subset of these novel peptides right and then if you do that it this list goes down and then by using various uh, 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 tabs that are open here you can visualize the spectra using lorikeet this is all within galaxy. So, you can use a lorikeet visualization tool to look at which B and Y ends are or which um, uh, peaks are uh, annotated with B and Y ends how many of these are continuous B and Y and so on. So, basically look at the spectral quality because even if you have done 1 percent FDR and if you are getting really good great score for your peptide it is not necessary that the spectral annotation is good. And I think it is important that if you are identifying a novel peptide you at least have the means to uh, you know to, to show or convince yourself and then the reviewer that this uh, you know this is a peptide that indeed is novel and is uh, definitely ne needs a further interrogation. Uh, one can also perform genomic localization using that MVP tool that I mentioned. So, uh, again uh, in that tutorial there is this peptide that we looked at and as you can see uh, it is annotated uh, quite well. Now, the lorikeet viewer also is interactive in the sense you can check on B and Y and so on and so forth to select these. So, this if you were to do this manually this would maybe take you know 20 minutes to half an hour 
for somebody to look at each of these. Well, this takes a few minutes or even a few seconds to go through this. It also gives you an uh, option to say this is a good one or bad one, so that you can, you know it kind of you can look at the list of all your novel peptides that you have here. Let's say if you have 200 of them, you can look at the spectral quality, and then only select those that are uh, that are important for you. Um, the next part is genomic localization. So again, by using various buttons uh, or various um, uh, features, uh, when you look at the protein view report in uh, in the uh, MZ SQLite file, you can open the integrated genomics viewer, <coughs> and then you can look at um, you know what what are the variations that you see. And there are you know you can lay down tracks and look at the. RNA seq data, you can look at the uh, three frame translation of the DNA sequence, uh, the annotated peptide sequences, and so on and so forth. So, it kind of gives you a pretty good way of looking at um, of the at, at the peptide that you identified. And you can also scroll uh, and look at adjacent peptides and so on and so forth. So, the eventual output that comes out of this is uh, you tell it tells you a chromosome number, what is the start and stop sign, what is the peptide that came out of it. And what's the annotation? You know, where do these peptides uh, lie? The ones that you found in CDS were basically um, the ones uh, that were either single amino acid variants, or there were some that we found in the five prime your untranslated region, and so on and so forth. So, if you have, let's say, hundreds of them, it helps you to identify um, or even classify these peptides uh, based on the variants that you found. It also gives you something more interesting. You can uh, sort this by chromosome, and then you might even see a pattern uh, wherein these peptides maybe are lying around a particular region, and by th that kind of gives you an idea about uh, mutation that could be occurring in that particular phenotype. Right? Uh, you can use uh, the information, the output that you generated from this. Uh, you can just take that link and open it in US UCSC genome browser, and then you can. Look at uh, more details about you know how what how do, how was this gene or the homology of that particular gene in in other organisms and convince yourself that the mutation that you see is indeed novel or is similar to some other organisms. Right. So again, there is information here uh, that you can use it through UCSC browser, um, and in this case for this that particular peptide I talked about. The same peptide, right? Uh, that's the lo localization we found that there was a mutation in this particular region uh, that G had gotten converted into A. Uh, you can also, and this is not used in Galaxy, but you can also go beyond and use some other tools to look at which, you know, what are the conserved domains that uh, that it occurs in. Um, so, I mean, uh, basically, uh, I would really strongly encourage you to go ahead and. Uh, use that uh, tool because if you're interested in using proteogenomics or using Galaxy for proteogenomics, I'm sure most of you are interested in proteogenomics. Uh, but and it kind of gives you a sense of um, you know how it can be used. Now it's again set up for a small data set, you know, with uh, with something that works in maybe an hour or two. But you you know you could also think about then upgrading that to uh, you know using it for larger data set, your own data sets, for example. So, I just wanted to mention that Galaxy P is not only about proteogenomics, we also work in the area of uh, metaproteomics and metabolomics. So, we are developing tools and workflows to enable that analysis as well. Um, <coughs> and then, yeah, so this is what I would encourage uh, go try it out, look at this site. There are instructions, uh, all you need is a registration and password, and uh, uh, you know, a login and password. And uh, if you use this documents, which are really detailed. And we have used it for at least three workshops last or this year. Um, you know, feel free to try it out. Again, these are the same documents. Uh, as I said, as a backup, if this fails, you can always try this instance. And as I was mentioning to somebody here, uh, this would be a instance that would be there for longer. So if you want to just skip that and start using that, that's fine too. Um, just wanted to acknowledge the people who were uh, responsible to make this happen. Uh, uh, Praveen Kumar uh, and Professor Tim Griffin. Uh, Professor Tim Griffin is the PI of the Galaxy Grant, and Subina Mehta uh, were uh, the people who actually. Uh, so Praveen developed a few software uh, along with James Johnson, 
but Subina Mehta actually tested them uh, and also worked on the documentation uh, that you, you can go and have a look at. Uh, lastly, we work with multiple researchers around the world, uh, not only users but also developers because um, you know dev tools are getting developed in, in uh, you know as, as the field is emerging not only in proteogenomics but other fields as well. We see that many tools are getting developed. So we try to work with the best um, tools that are available, try to package it in Galaxy and integrate into workflows, links to uh, uh, you know uh, you, you can actually go to galaxyp.org um, and find more information. There is also galaxyp.org slash contact if you want to contact us. Uh, but with that I think I will uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Yeah, so the mapping file that is generated from the second workflow would have that information. But, uh, does your database currently have the list of uh, all unidentified uh, spike junction sequences? So yes, for a particular data set it will have it, right? So you need to run your data set, your RNA-seq data to get that. So I mean for this uh, example, yes we do have it. Uh, if you run some other data sets uh, we have, which we have done, we have that. Um, uh, yeah, so it is possible. So that is why we have those two different workflows, one which is single amino acid variants which uses a different set of tools and junctions which is a slightly more a larger genomic reorganization, right. Uh, so yeah. And it is not only captured in your genome mapping file but it is also captured in a protein FASTA file. You will have your genomic coordinates and you know the fact that it is a junction, a novel junction. Um, I would encourage you to do the hands on session later with the documentation but I can show you what what I was talking about in the sense I can show you this in action or where things are um, and again if there are more questions I can take them. So this is the this is the galaxy instance right uh, does this work? No. So, you know, for you to log in and register, this would be, you know, so I am already registered, logged in into this, right. This is the tool format and this is the, uh, the history and this is the pane, uh, the central pane. So the way you start it is you go to shared data and then there are histories, click on history. So as you can see there is an input history here, right, and if I click on that. It shows these are the 5 files or 10 files in fact that I have here and I can explain why there are 10 files and not 5 or and we can see only 6 of them sorry. And then I go to this place called import history and you can name this anything. So I can call this Mumbai and I import it. Once I import it, it basically goes here. So this is just one way, this is for the tutorial, but you could also have all your data sets on your or somewhere else, right, on the FTP site or uh, on, on, your, on your computer and you can upload that as well. So there is an upload uh, function that is also available, but you know for the sake of this, uh, so here as you can see there is a fastq file, there is a gtf file, fasta file, mgf files and so on. Um, and you know there are again icons here, uh, I can try to look at the data, so if I click on this, the central pane shows me which chromosome, you know what is the format of that particular file and that is true for your fastq file as well um, and so on and so forth, right, BAM file. So one can look at that. On the left side here are tools available, so you can also search tools, for example if I were to look at search GUI, you know. <laughs> it, it shows me that there is this tool called search GUI and then associated peptide checker tool. But again um, for the sake of workshop if I go, so you can actually you know spend a lot of time looking at this and then if you go to the shared data you can go to workflows now and what we are trying to do is convert this FASTU file in a protein FASTA file. So go to a workflow 
and I'm going to select the first workflow which is um, or the, the second one here which is uh, workflow one RNA seq database generation right. So, I go here and I say import and once I import I can say start using this workflow right and there are there is one feature which I did not talk about, but this is the workflow now. So, if you look here if I click here this workflow is uh, is in your uh, you know it you have kind of transferred the workflow in your domain. You can modify the workflow. Uh, so, <coughs> I can show you that. So, if you have this right I go to this uh, but so there are many things here, but I and I would strongly encourage you to go and explore these. So, I go to this place called edit. And then hopefully very soon it will open uh, the the workflow uh, output that we are seeing earlier. So, you, you can see here this basically shows the the structure and I think there is a way of reducing this though I do not know how to do this on this computer. Um, but you know you can reduce the size and look at this, but here you can actually see that there is a fast queue file, the GTF file as an input and there are these various tools that we talked about right. So, now for example, if I wanted to go into this tool right and if you for example, wanted to um, not have I mean I am just giving an example let us say this says run individually, but I, if I want to say no I want to change that to merge I can do that and save this, but I might name this differently or I could I can change anything here and save it. Um, and so, you can modify these you can also add things to these workflows, you can add inputs or outputs from these workflows, add tools to these workflows. So, it is quite uh, flexible that way right. And then uh, so, I am I'm not going to save this because uh, or maybe I will just have this yeah. So, um, and from here I can now run the workflow right. So, maybe I will save this and I will run the workflow. You can run also run it from the earlier uh, place that I showed you and when I am running the workflow now all I need to ensure is that I uh, select the right input. So, here uh, this says the first one should be fast queue, but it is showing fast a file. So, I might go to you know select the right one which is the fast queue file. Here um, I need to select GTF file. So, I select that and thirdly this is right. So, this is the protein fast a file that I have and then I go ahead and I just click and you know. So, each one of these as you can see are tools in that workflow right and there are 20 such tools. So, or oh sorry there are 22 such tools right and then I go ahead and just say well, run workflow and then what will start happening is and you should you will see you should be able to see this very soon is that the outputs as you can see have started piling up. So, our in initial inputs were here and the first file has started getting converted from the first tool and this will start happening for rest of them and all these proteins or all these uh, in inputs will start getting generated. So, this is how you are generating history right and maybe they just wanted to have um, a more dramatic way of saying I generated history, but I do not know I mean that is why it is called history. So, at the end of it we should have these outputs that are coming out right. So, I am um, going to kind of just jump and skip to the next history which is. Uh, so, let us just imagine that uh, you know that history is run right. Uh, which it showed in 12 minutes we have checked that. So, I am going to go to history 2 and import that history and sometimes I actually put in dates. So, that I know you know which of these workflows were run on which dates, but in this case I am just saying Mumbai because I know if I just store the same thing it might conflict with my not conflict, but I might get confused later if I have to select it. What is that? Uh, history 2 is basically a uh, no history 2 is an output from the first workflow. So, the ones that were gray right now once you run them you will have history 2. So, I am kind of doing like a cook cooking show right I mean just imagine this is cooked now let us look at the second one yeah. This will be the input files yes yeah first workflow and the third one would be from the second workflow history 1 should be the result of our first workflow. I am just going to import it just the way it is. So, that would have 
everything that is run and I'll show you what we do next. I wanted to kind of just mention that if you have a completed history, um, you can convert this into a workflow. So I'll, 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 I know this is a little advanced, but I'll just show you. Um, so for example, this is your, you know, after running the first workflow and you generally do it this in a stepwise manner, right? You can go to this wheel and then say extract workflow. And so now what happens is if I have run a history, right, I can call it something, right, uh, right, and then I say create workflow and it will generate a workflow. Now I can share this workflow with you. You can take your input files and run on it. Uh, I can share the workflow with anybody. So the ability to share, so let's say if we are on the same Galaxy instance, I should be able to take this workflow, right, and then I can uh, I can share it. So all I all I have to do is generate a link and then send this to you by email. If you click on this, you log in on this, you should be able to open that workflow. So that kind of helps you to not generate yeah use the same parameters. Um, so coming back to that. Um, yeah, so again, you know, once you do this, uh, what I'll do is maybe just show you. So we did the same thing now. We, we search the database and then we generate outputs. What I'll show you is the last output that is generated, which is basically everything together, right? You have input files, uh, output from the first workflow, second workflow, and third workflow, which is one here. And then we can very quickly see if we can look at some of the features. And Galaxy uh, has been in use in genomic studies for quite a few years now. Uh, we're basically just adapting it and using the ability that the fact that you know it's really strong in genomics and transcriptomics to use it for proteogenomics because then it's easier to merge these. So you can basically go through this really step by step manner. It also gives you information of basics of Galaxy, what are histories and all that. So it really is a very easy way of learning Galaxy if you're interested. So those who are interested, please go and use this. And then later, once you uh, get a good feel for it, you can also contact us at galaxyp.org, I think, uh, which is at the end. We have contact. Yeah, so you can contact us galaxyp.org and we can suggest. So there are some uh, sites in Europe right now, which have got a lot, lot more, um, you know, uh, infrastructure. So you can run your data sets on that. Or you could also contact some researchers who are locally running Galaxy as well to run some of your data sets there. So, um, so uh, this is the final summary uh, or the, you know, after running all the three workflows. As you can see here, it generates this output um, with the peptide, the number of spectra that it was identified with, what was the localization, which chromosome, uh, what was the start site. It also gives you this uh, link that you can use to uh, open in a UCSC browser to look at, you know, which is kind of an alt, oh, sorry, an alternative way of looking at uh, than IGV browser. Uh, so this is the MZ2 SQLite MVP output that I talked about. And if I click on this visualize an MVP application, it opens this application. No, so these ones here are not novel. These are all the peptide sequences from your MZ identimal file. But in your history, you have a place where it says. Uh, novel peptides. Yeah, so this 58 history is a list of novel peptides. So these are only, you know, since this was a small data set, there are, uh, what, eight of them here, right? And then the MVP application basically helps you to load that from Galaxy. And then here you would see only those eight peptides. If I click on it, It opens this, oh. and then yeah. So it gives you this peptide here, and now I can select, uh, you know, whatever internal lines. Yeah, but uh, it's not so. It's not been annotated right now. So I'm, if I add this, and you're right. I mean, you know, if you think it's not a, you know, you know if I start doing this, um, 
you you know you might agree with it but it's it's a very subjective thing right i might think okay three ions um, continuous is good but you might not and at least it gives you an ability to uh, to look into that um but yes i mean it it helps you to do that but you can also do it for other spectra and so on and so forth so right now oh yeah so and then so if i go from load from galaxy if i do that i should be able to i can get those eight now and i can also go to view in protein which i might not cover right now uh, i can then select this peptide because we went from a rna seq data so it's from your protein fasta file but then it gives you ability to look at uh, look at yeah so this is a genome centric view and now if i go here <coughs> you know so there are there are ways that you can look into this um or uh, you can expand this and look at the three frame translation of that particular peptide you can see that peptide is here the third frame um uh, and you know so so anyway i mean again this is for one peptide but if you had 200 peptides or many peptides you should be able to see that so so i think with that i will um end this In today's lecture, I hope you have learned that two output files from RNA seq to FASTA database creation workflow, which means the FASTA file and genome mapping files. You also got a glimpse of how one can search for novel variants using three basic steps shown by Dr. Pratik Jagtap. We also learned that how one can use Galaxy output files and use it in different online softwares. like integrated genomics viewer igv to understand the mutations in a gene in the next lecture you will listen another speaker dr ratna thangadu who will talk about large scale data science thank you